John chapter 17, we're going to begin this morning here at verse 1. Let me just read the verse and then we'll get into some of the, the background and the setting for it as we make our way through. John 17, 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you. When we come to John chapter 17, we should understand the setting. Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. They've eaten a meal together, a Passover meal, and then they went into one of those long talks that you'll often have after a meal when you got family business to talk about. One of those serious talks. I mean, we got real things to talk about. And as Jesus spoke to his disciples, it was especially heavy on his heart to explain to them how they were going to get along and what he expected of them because he was leaving them. You see, that night, in just a few hours, he would go to the Garden of Gethsemane and be betrayed and arrested. In a few hours after that, he would be nailed to a cruel cross. After the cross, he'd be put in the tomb. After the tomb, he'd rise from the dead. After he rose from the dead, he would ascend to heaven. He was leaving them. These men, who had given the last three years of their life to follow his every step and to listen to his every word, he was leaving them, and he needed to prepare them for it. So he had this long after-dinner discussion with them. And when he had finished it all, did you see, remember it from last week? This is what he said to him when it was all finished in chapter 16, verse 33. This was his conclusion. These things I have spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Those are his last words of teaching to the disciples. But, but, but it wasn't enough. Jesus said, okay, that's good. Break. Now garden of Gethsemane. He can't leave those men. He can't leave that room without praying. We know that Jesus was a man of prayer. The disciples often recorded in the Gospels how often Jesus prayed. He was a man of prayer. But do you understand something? This, in John chapter 17, is the only extended prayer of Jesus that we have in the whole New Testament. We know that he prayed. We have some short prayers of Jesus. This chapter, John 17, is absolutely unique. There's not many times I get to say that about a section of scripture, that it's absolutely unique, that this is the only place in the Bible where we have an extended prayer of the Son of God, and it reveals something about him. So sometimes we say, if you really want to get to know a person, pray with them. There's something about the openness, about the yieldedness, about just pouring out a heart before God that reveals who they really are. We're going to learn something about Jesus this and the next few weeks as we go through John chapter 17. But there's another reason why we need to grab onto this. We need to grab onto this because Jesus is fulfilling this function of praying for his people. Even as he did in John 17, he's fulfilling that function right now. The Bible says that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he didn't go to heaven just to sit on a barca lounger and relax for 2,000 years until he returns, but he is actively engaged on behalf of his people right now. It says that he ever lives to make intercession for his people. Jesus is praying for you. I don't know if you got a praying grandmother. I don't know if you got a praying mom or uncle. I don't know if anybody prays for you, but if nobody prays for you in the whole world, if you are a son or a daughter of God, Jesus prays for you. And do you want to know something about his heart and his mind and he prays for you? It's in John 17. He shows you the themes, the things that are important to him as he prays for his people. So how did he do it? Look again at verse 1. Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. By the way, he's following the traditional posture of prayer at that time and in that culture. At that time in that culture, the traditional posture of prayer was to stand 
to raise your hands. By the way, the Bible says that raise your, lift up your hands unto the Lord. That's why oftentimes we'll encourage you in praise and worship to lift up your hands to God. It's kind of a sign of surrender. It's a sign of giving. It's a sign of reaching out. But here, Jesus would lift up his hands and he would look up into heaven. That was the traditional posture of prayer. In our culture today, traditional posture of prayer in the Western world in the 21st century, it's something like this. You fold your hands, you close your eyes, and you kind of bend your head just a little bit. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with it at all. Matter of fact, it's kind of good for you to get your smartphone out of your hands for five seconds so that you can pray to God. Closing your eyes is good to get rid of the distractions. Bowing your head if it's an expression of reverence to God, praise the Lord. But what I'm saying is there's nothing inherently biblical about that posture. But Jesus lifted his eyes towards heaven and he began this prayer. Now, one, one other thing I have to say about this prayer. Friends, this is a sad scene. Jesus is leaving these men. He's about to be betrayed by one of those who was his disciples. He's about to suffer terribly on the cross. The next 12 hours looks incredibly bleak for Jesus and his disciples. It's gonna be like a catastrophe for them. All of that's on the way. You would think that this prayer is like one of the prayers in the Psalms that cries out to God from a place of agony, Oh God, I'm dying, help me. There's lots of prayers like that in the Psalms. This prayer isn't like that at all. This prayer is rich, it's deep, it's full of emotion and feeling. It just stirs you as you read it. But you know what? It is not a sad prayer in the slightest. It is a prayer of triumph. It is a prayer of filled with the glory of God and a victory. You'll see what I mean. Look at what he says here in verse one. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. Notice first what he says. Father, the hour has come. Many previous times in the gospel of John, Jesus has said something like this. My hour's not yet come. My hour's not yet come. Now what does he say? The hour has come Now's the time. I have come to fulfill and finish the work you've given me to do. So he prays, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. First of all, he prayed, Father, would you glorify your son? Would you work in me so that I can complete what is ahead of me in the coming hours? Do you understand that as Jesus was on the cross, that the Father was at work in the Son through the entire ordeal? We're gonna come to it later in a few weeks when we talk about Jesus being on the cross. And it's important to know and understand this idea of how the Father judged the Son on the cross and how the Son felt and was forsaken on the cross. But we can take that too far and act as if there was this radical separation between the Father and the Son. Please understand this. The Bible tells us that on the cross that the Father was in the Son, reconciling the world unto himself. He says, Father, work in me. I need you. I rely on you. Glorify the Son. Why? What does he say there at the end of verse one? That your Son also may glorify you. All this talk of glory may make us think that he's talking about his second coming, not the work that's gonna come on the cross in just a few minutes. But no, my friends, Jesus says simply this. He says that when he goes to the cross, it's gonna be an incredible expression of the glory of God. The world could only see shame, humiliation, blood, and death at the cross. Jesus said this is gonna be the glory of God manifest. Father, glorify your son that he may also glorify you. Let me pause just for a moment. Do you understand that right before Jesus went to the cross, that he was very focused on the idea that he must glorify his Father. He was not merely in survival mode. Do you kind of know what survival mode is? God, please get me through these next few hours. 
we've all been there in some place or another. Jesus had his eyes lifted up to a vision bigger than just surviving the next few hours of trial. Friends, he was locked in to glorifying God the Father. I'm gonna say something. It's gonna have a little bit of a sharp edge to it. And I'm gonna say it to you, but I want you to know I'm saying it to myself as well. But I'm gonna say it as if I'm just saying it to you. How concerned are you about giving glory to God in your life? Honestly, for the average person in our community, the person who really doesn't know Jesus Christ, just walking up and down State Street, enjoying their life just like anybody else, for the average person in this world, it is of no concern at all to them if their life glorifies God. But if we are disciples of Jesus, if if his life-changing power has come into us, Should we not be concerned about giving God glory? Should we not be concerned about increasing his fame, attention drawn to him, renown in this world? Has not God given us something greater to live for than our own comfort, our own pleasure, our own ease? We live our lives not only for that, but in a much greater way, we live our lives to bring some glory to our God and Father. This is something that is incomprehensible to those who don't know God but it should be familiar to those who are the children of God. To those who have said, no, my life is given to Jesus Christ. I look over my week and I say, okay, on Tuesday I'm doing this. Monday's Labor Day, but on Tuesday I'm doing this. Wednesday I'm doing this. Thursday I'm doing this. I should be able to look at my calendar and say, how can I give you glory in these things that I'm here to do? I don't have to go away to a monastery to bring you glory. I don't have to go away to a seminary. I don't have to do these different things, which may be good in and of themselves, but to give God glory in my life? He says, no, I can give and surrender my life to him in what I have going on right now so that I can give him glory. Unless on your schedule for this coming week was to rob a liquor store or something like that. You can't do that unto God's glory. But listen, normally, in the normal occasions of our life that we have, in our career, in our school, in our home, in our neighborhood, we can give God glory in those things, even as Jesus was concerned to do. Now going on to verse two. He says, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You see what Jesus said in verse two? What an astounding thing for a man to say in front of other people. In front of other people as Jesus played because please remember, he's not sequestered away in a prayer closet as he prays this. He prays this in the presence of his disciples and he says, without any seeming hesitation or embarrassment, he says, you have given him authority over all flesh. Yeah, Father, you know me, I'm the guy that you've given authority over all flesh. Everything that breathes on this earth, I have authority over it. If Jesus is not God, he's crazy. If Jesus is not God, then he thinks that he has authority over all flesh. Inga Lil and I, we have sometimes a thing that we do, or I do. I think she just kind of smiles kindly at it when we do. We'll go somewhere and we'll be looking over a nice city scene. You know, there's a nice thing, a harbor or a city, you know, as if you were to go up in the hills here in Santa Barbara and look over the city. And sometimes I'll put my arm around Ingalil and I'll say, someday, babe, this will all be yours. (laughs) It's just a stupid little running joke. We have those kind of things. Now, if I actually thought it, I'd be crazy. As if I had it and I had the authority to give it to anybody. Jesus is just so bold to look over all humanity and he says, everything that breathes belongs to me. And because it belongs to me, look at what he says going on. He says, you've given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Friends, that idea gives us new hope for evangelism. It gives us new hope for missionary work because when we know that Jesus has authority over all flesh, Even if people right now reject him, even if people right now are ignorant over him, there's still a sense in which he has authority over them. And so what does it do? It prompts us to pray. 
Jesus, just because this person is rejecting you, it doesn't mean that they are yet out of your reach. Would you grab a hold of them, Jesus? Would they be one of those to whom you grant eternal life, even as you said? Because he has authority over all flesh. Friends, Philippians chapter two, verses 10 and 11 is a demonstration of this idea that Jesus has authority over all flesh. Can I read those verses to you? Paul wrote, he said, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and in those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now and in the age to come, he has authority over all flesh. And instead of making us discouraged anyway, it should make us say, Jesus, would you use that authority? Would you bring this person into your kingdom? Because verse two says that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. But then notice this in the next phrase in verse three, he says, and this is eternal life that they may know you. Knowing God is the source of eternal life. But I need to make a little distinction here. In the original language that the New Testament was written in, they had two words to describe two different kinds of knowing. We translate it with the same English word know, but there's two different ancient words that express this. One of those ancient words has the idea to know by intuition. How do I know it? I just know it. That's one kind of knowledge. There's another kind of ancient word, and it's used here in this particular verse. It means to know by experience. And you'd agree, wouldn't you, that those are two different kinds of knowledge? You can know by intuition that you shouldn't drive too fast on the 101, but then you know by experience, by getting that $400 speeding ticket. Now you really know that you shouldn't drive too fast on the 101. There's knowing by intuition, there's knowing by experience. The word that Jesus used here was to know by experience. Friends, it is an experiential knowledge of God. It's this true, genuine relationship with him that brings us into eternal life. It's not merely just a theoretical knowledge or distant knowledge. No, it's a knowledge that is real and experiential. Then he goes on now into verse four. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Something I want you to notice here. In those two verses, Jesus makes no reference to his disciples really at all. His entire focus is praying to his Father in heaven. And as he prays to his Father in heaven, the first thing he says is, I have glorified you on the earth. The cross would be the consummation of the glory, but it wasn't the beginning of it. Jesus glorified the Father through his whole life, through his faith, his obedience, through the work and the years of his earthly ministry. Every sermon he preached, every blind man he gave sight to, every person that he delivered from demonic possession, every piece of instruction, every confrontation with the religious leaders, all of it together, it gave glory to God the Father. But then looking forward, Jesus says in verse four, I have finished the work. It's fascinating. If they had watches back then, you wouldn't blame one of the disciples for interrupting the prayer of Jesus at that point and saying, Jesus, excuse me, but by my watch, it's gonna be another 12 or so hours until you finish the work. You haven't finished it yet. You're not on the cross. But do you understand that Jesus was so determined and so set in what God had him to do that for him, it was done. It was finished. He had not yet carried it out, but it was already decided. It was already determined. As far as Jesus was considered, uh, concerned, the work was finished. It was completed in the heart and the mind of God and his son, and now it just had to be done. That's why Jesus prays in verse five, glorify me together with yourself. It's a strange prayer to pray. I think of me praying such a prayer. Glorify me together with yourself. Here's the problem. 
when I pray that prayer, I'm usually praying it for my own sake and for some kind of glory that would be given to me independent of God. The son could pray that towards the father utterly dependent on the Father himself. That's why he says, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Here we're given a glimpse into something of the relationship of the persons of the Trinity. You, you know this expression of what the biblical doctrine is that we call the Trinity. Here's the thing. We have one God. There is one God. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not tritheists. We do not worship three gods. There is one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the persons of the Trinity had a relationship of love and shared glory before anything was ever created. That's what Jesus is pouring out here in his prayer when he says in verse five, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Father, you remember the glory we shared together. Let that continue through in the continuation and the completion of my work here on earth. And then we come to verse six. And in verse six, Jesus changes the focus of his prayer. The first five verses were basically Jesus praying in relationship between him and his father. But now he's gonna pray, of course, to the father, but for his people, for his disciples. Have you ever had somebody pray for you and you're listening to them? Now, they're not really talking to you, they're praying for you, and you learn things about their heart for you as they pray for you. You kind of understand that dynamic? That's exactly what's going on with Jesus and the disciples right now. They're learning things about Jesus' heart for them as he prays for them. So notice how this prayer begins, verse six. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, for I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Notice the first thing he says. Again, he's not speaking to the disciples. He's speaking to his Father in heaven. And he says right there in verse six, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me. Father, you gave me certain men. Now, by the way, I thought Jesus chose his own disciples. Well, he did, but he chose them after praying all night. And the father showed him, the father told him exactly who the men were that he should choose to be his disciples. So Jesus makes this prayer. The father gives him these particular ones. And what does Jesus say? He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me. Jesus thought about his three years of teaching and ministry with his chosen disciples and he summarizes it all with this phrase. What did I do? I manifested your name to these men. There's these, these 11 men. Remember, Judas has already left the room. These 11 men, if I've done anything, I have displayed who you are to them. I've manifested your name. Do you know what the word manifest even means? We don't use that word very much. To manifest something is simply to display it. If I take this bottle of water, if I hide it behind the Bible, you can't see it. If I expose it to where you can see it, I have manifested this bottle of water. Something that was, was hidden is now made apparent, it's manifested. Therefore, Jesus says, the name, the character, the nature of God, it was hidden, but I manifested it, I lived it out. Again, if I could make a side point on this, the fact that Jesus lived out the goodness and the righteousness and the grace and the holiness of God shows that he manifested God's name to them. We as believers, we have a similar responsibility in this world today. I don't know if this was really explained to you when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, but one of the responsibilities upon you as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, is that Jesus wants you to manifest, to make visible his name to the earth. So that what is Jesus like? Jesus is loving. Jesus is holy. 
Jesus is wise. Jesus, on and on and on. The strength, the power, the goodness of Jesus should be manifest in our life. The world can't see Jesus, but they can see my life. And I can manifest something of Jesus to them from my life. Now, that's a very challenging thought, don't you think? Here's what makes it possible. Jesus lives in me. His spirit is in me. So it's not like, do this for me and then maybe you'll be good enough. No, he goes, I live in you. I just want to live out my life in and through so that the world can see. Because the world, as much as we might want to tell the world, look to Jesus, don't look to me. As much as we might want to tell the world, read the Bible, don't listen to me. Friends, they're going to look at our lives. That's why in the New Testament it says that we are living letters written by the Spirit. And the world is going to read us. Friends, I'll just put it to you plainly. You are the Bible that most people in the world are going to read. You might want to backpedal from it. No, 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 don't look at me, look at Jesus. And ultimately, that's true, people should. But they want to look to you and see, are you manifesting the life of Jesus? Is it apparent in your life? So Jesus said this regarding the men that the Father had given him out of the world. And then notice how Jesus speaks of them so complimentary in verse six. He says of these men, they have kept your word. You might say that Jesus is being very generous to his disciples. You know, we as preachers, we kind of have a fault. We like to beat up on the disciples. It's probably from our own insecurities. We like to point out their flaws. And we usually present the disciples as a bunch of like three stooges, incompetent screw-ups. That's oftentimes how we present them. You know how Jesus looked at his disciples? Even with all their faults, all their failings, all their difficulties, he looks at those men and goes, they have kept my word. They have kept my word. That is worth something. Jesus, would you honor them? Father, would you bless them? They have kept my word. And then he goes on to say, verse eight, they have known surely that I came forth from you. The disciples didn't understand everything about Jesus and his work. They're gonna be really confused when he goes to the cross in a few hours. But at this point, at least they were convinced of the divine origin of Jesus and his teaching. And Jesus said, that's a great start. I wonder, I wonder, who among here, Jesus looks at you and he knows, all right, you got a long way to go, but my, what a great start you had. You've got a good start with me. You know my word, you know something of my word, you've kept my word, and, and you know Jesus came from God. That's a starting point, but man, it's a great start. That's exactly how Jesus looked at his disciples. Now, we'll, we'll finish up this morning with verses 9 and 10. You know, it's sort of a shame that I, I have to break up this great chapter, John 17, over three Sundays. Part of me is tempted just to have a marathon teaching session where, like, for an hour and a half, I'll just teach on the whole chapter because the whole chapter in its continuity is wonderful. But we'll try to keep it together piece by piece. This morning, let's just look at the last two verses we're going to look at, verses 9 and 10. Jesus says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. The first thing Jesus says, he goes, listen, Father, I'm not praying for the whole world. I'm praying for them. I'm praying for these 11 right here. I pray for my disciples. I'm not praying for the whole world. And I could see somebody being annoyed with that. Oh, Jesus, won't you pray for the whole world? Don't you love the whole world? Why wouldn't you pray for the whole world? Have you given up on the world? Have you abandoned the world? No, no, not at all. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus loves the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves the world. Jesus loves the world. Then why did he say, I'm not praying for the world. I'm only gonna pray for my disciples here because Jesus knew the way to reach the world was through those disciples. And there's a sense in which Jesus, when he intercedes for you from heaven, it's to equip you to reach a needy world around you. It's not merely to bless you and help you and rescue you, all that's involved. But it's through you a needy world might be reached. That's why Jesus prayed for his disciples. And he prayed for them with the authority of saying it. Did you see that in verse 10? All mine are yours. Father, everything I have belongs to you. But then the next phrase, and yours are mine. 
Father, when we have a man, when we have a woman in our kingdom, he belongs to both of us. Who do you belong to? Do you belong to God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit? And the answer to that question is, yes. You belong to all, and the Father says, all mine, all mine, all mine. And as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together in concert, that's the beautiful way that they do it. And then Jesus, here in verse 10, with which we will finish this morning, he says, I am glorified in them. How amazing would it be to hear Jesus pray those words over you? Father, this son, this daughter of mine, I know their weaknesses, I know their failings, but you know what? I also know this. I am glorified in them. No, Lord, not Peter. You're not glorified in Peter. He's gonna deny you three times. Jesus says, I'm glorified in him. No, Lord, not those other ones. All those other disciples. The only one that's going to see you at the crucifixion is going to be John. The rest of them are going to run. You're not glorified in it. No, I am glorified in them. And knowing that Jesus would think such about me, it makes something rise up in my heart. I hope it rises up in your heart. Jesus, I want to give you glory with my life. This is something so distant from the common person in this world, the idea of giving Jesus glory with your life. But brothers, sisters, should this not be in the heart of God's people? Should we not say that my life is given for something more than just the success that I have in the 70 or 80 or 90 years on this earth? It should just be for more than the goodness of enjoying family blessings, the more of accomplishing great things and all the rest of it, that there should be something in my life, something real, something tangible that gives glory to Jesus Christ. And him in my life lived out through me, this is what really gives the disciple a sense of satisfaction. Friends, the disciple knows that it's right. Jesus should be glorified in me. People should be able to see the strength of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the goodness of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, the truth of Jesus. They should be able to see something of it in me. And to not let you off the hook, and in you. This is how Jesus prayed, and this is how disciples live. I feel a little bit bad that we have to push the pause button here and pick it up next Sunday at verse 11. But if I could say this, this prayer of Jesus only gets deeper and more powerful as we go on. But let me just finish with this thought. If this is how Jesus prayed for you at 11 that night, Don't you believe he's praying with the same themes for you right now from heaven? Don't you think that Jesus is praying for you with that heart that says, I am glorified in them, that he is and he wants to be more and more. So Father, that's our prayer. Our prayer, Heavenly Father, is that you would so work in us that our life would be an answer to the prayer of Jesus. The prayer of Jesus that we would bring you glory. Father, I'm aware, I can feel it, Lord, I can sense it at how out of step this is with the way that the world around us thinks. But Lord, that's okay. We didn't surrender our life to you to be in step with the world, but Lord, where it's necessary to walk after your path, after your way. Jesus, I pray that you would help us to look very consciously, Lord, even just with this next week and at the events of our life, both expected and unexpected, to appreciate this is how we can give you glory. And Lord, we pray that you would work in our heart to make that satisfying to us as your disciples. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for praying for us, Jesus. We pray this in your name.